Lord, thank you for your word, and we pray that you would encourage our hearts as we look to your word, Father, for instruction and to understand the times that we're in, to understand, understand these uh, events that may be happening very, very soon. And so help us to look up to you, Father. Help us to expect your coming and to know, Lord, that you're, you're, uh, you're coming back very soon. And so we pray that you would uh, uh, help us, Lord, to live this life, Lord, uh, the way you want us to live this life. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, chapter 1, Paul is encouraging the church of Thessalonica, right? And we went through that in light of all the persecution and all the suffering that they've been going through at this time. Chapter 2 is a good chapter. We, we went over that, a couple of segments of that. But they were thinking that they were living in the day of the Lord. And Paul assures them, hey, you're not living in the day of the Lord. Mm. Remember the day of the Lord, like we said, is a series, I guess you can say, of events uh, that will be happening So um, during a period of time. So Paul writes them, encourages them uh, by the thanks that he gives for them and by the promises he gave to them and by the prayers he gave on, uh, really on behalf of them. And so remember, Paul was super encouraged to the church of Thessalonica in chapter 2. He's like, I, I'm boasting about you guys to everybody. Like, you guys are, you know, he's, in his prayers, he's mentioning the church of Thessalonica. So they impacted his heart so much so that those three weeks that he spent with them, he, uh, he was impacted. And obviously they were impacted because they were getting into God's Word, they were studying the Word, right? They were, But they were going through persecution, and the thing is that they were actually enduring the persecution because of the Gospel's sake. Within those three-week period of time, they were impacted so much so to stand their ground on the Word of God. So, um, And I could imagine, like, you you know certain people, when they come around, they, they know how to, like, really instruct you and give you the knowledge that you need, and... Paul's one of those guys that I would see that, right? He, he knows how to equip the saints. And so he's not joking around. So that's chapter 2 is with, he's dealing with enlightenment. And, and that's kind of what I see here. Paul's going to enlighten them uh, to the time of, well, I guess you could say the end time uh, or timeline of events that are going to happen in the end times. And so remember the church of Thessalonica, right? They're going through persecution at this time. They're going through suffering at this time. They were going through trials, tribulations, and they thought they were living in the day of the Lord. And so Paul is going to clarify these events that happened during the time of the day of the Lord. So let's just go ahead and read chapter 2, verse 1, and we'll go, let's maybe up to verse 8, and then uh, we'll go ahead and go over it. Look at verse 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ, or the day of the Lord, those that are that the same thing, had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? Come on, guys, you know, that's what he's saying. And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he, speaking of the Holy Spirit, is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. And, well, let's just stop there. Actually, let's go up to verse 7. I just like verse 8. Add that in there. Uh, but Paul's talking about these events, right, that are proceeding or really surrounding this time period of the day of the Lord. And Paul starts off by really talking about three areas, three things, right? Paul enlightens them, number one, 
to the rapture of the church, uh, first of all, uh, of Christ, and secondly, Paul enlightens them to the revealing of the Antichrist, right? So we're going to find out who is this character that the Bible is talking about. And then uh, thirdly, Paul uh, enlightens them basically to the return of Christ, and I don't think we'll get to that yet. It's a little too much to add all today. Um, so let's look at the rapture of the church. Look at verse 1 and 2 again. It says, Now brethren, so the church, right, to the believers, to those who are in Christ, uh, who are faithful in Christ, concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if it from us, as though the day of Christ had come. So, the rapture of the church. Now, just to start off, before we get into whole, the whole rapture of the church, people are divided on verse 1 alone. So once you start to read verse 1, to the entire church, let's say you got the whole church, everybody who is alive here on the face of the world, there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be like, wait a minute, blah, 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 blah. I, I disagree, wait a minute. So there's a big division happening on verse 1 that people have different mindsets on. So there's a couple of views. I'm just going to give you two major views that everybody holds. Uh, so the first view is some say it's referring to his second coming which happens at the end of the 70th week of Daniel, according to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And so this is speaking of that seven-year period of time, right? That one week, that 70th week of Daniel. And, and Jesus Christ comes back to the earth, according to Revelation 19, 16, and according to Jude 1, 14, right? He's coming with all the saints, and he's writing back. So according to the last three verses really of chapter 12 of Daniel, <clears throat> there's a 45 day period of time where Jesus Christ will actually judge the nations at this point. Now we don't really hear a lot about this, but it's there, it's in scripture, so it's interesting. Um, but he's going to separate the goats to his left, he's going to separate the sheep, right, the believers, the church to his right, the faith, those who are faithful. And this is the first view, really, that people have here based on verse 1. And I would actually agree with this view as well as the second view. So I, I agree with both of them. I don't know about you guys. But the second view says, uh, concerning verse 1, talking about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and the gathering uh, of all of us together with him. Uh, second view says it refers to the rapture of the church rapture of the church so when jesus christ comes back for his saints his children his church right uh, to bring us home with him basically so notice at the end of verse one notice how it says by the coming of our lord jesus christ and by our gathering together onto him so very interesting so apparently these events are they happen together that's what, what's happening right here and question when are we going to be gathered together with Jesus Christ? At the rapture of the church, right? It's at the, it's at the, when we are caught up together in the clouds with him. In fact, look at 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, a page to your left. Look at verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together, there it is, harpazo, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Caught up with the Lord, very interesting. Um, this word, we'll, we'll be caught up with the Lord in the clouds. Isn't that cool? So he's not literally, physically, coming to this world and touching his feet on the world. He's coming to the world, I guess you can say physically, in, in the sense, but we're going to be caught up together. We're going to meet him. We're going to come together and be like, hey, oh, hey. Right? Well, I don't know. Hug, I don't know what we're doing, but we're meeting him. So uh, when, when Christ comes back, it's not to step foot on the earth, right? It's, it's to meet us in the clouds with himself. So this will happen prior to the 70th week of Daniel, uh, a time of tribulation, a time of trial, a time of... Uh, just great, great wrath, I guess you can say, being poured out on the face of the world. So there are other views on when the, the rapture happens, <clears throat> but I have a problem with that idea that the rapture happens 
in the middle of the tribulation time. So remember, when, how long does the tribulation time last? Seven years. Seven years, right? So half of seven years is what? Three and a half years. So last, the last three verses, according to Daniel uh, chapter 12, if you read it, we know that there is seven years. This is a one week. One week equals seven years. If that was the case, that we know the exact day that the rapture is going to happen, if you believe in a mid-trib view, right, that the, 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 the rapture is going to happen in the middle of the tribulation time. So you know the exact moment, basically, right? But you might say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, so yeah, okay, we understand the, the sign of the covenant. I guess that's when the prophetic clock counts down. So you can literally count the exact day and really the exact hour. So two, three and a half years, you know the exact day, you'll know the exact hour. And at, at that exact time, then boom, that's when we're going to be with the Lord. Voila, there it is. I believe the rapture is going to happen in the middle of the tribulation time. But wait a minute. Doesn't the Bible say something about nobody knows the day or the hour? Yes. So, boom, conflict with Scripture right there. So, right away, you're going to have to try to force your view into Scripture somehow with a whole bunch of conflict in Scripture. So, that's going to be really hard to stick with that mid-trib view. You guys see what I'm saying? Because there's a lot more Scripture, too, where it's like, oh, I don't know. Um, so it does, so that, that's why I don't believe in a mid-trib view, personally. But I also don't believe that it's going to happen at the end of the tribulation time, right? We would say post-trib view, um, things like that. So it sounds silly at first of all, right? You look at it and you're like, wait a minute. Um, okay, so tribulation time, seven years. Okay, I'm looking at this timeline. And at the very, very last, okay, so there's the wrath of God being poured out. All the believers are going to go through all that wrath with the world. And it's going to be a crazy, crazy time. Um, but all of a sudden, you're done with all the wrath. You're hurting, you're bleeding, you're going through all this pain and misery, right? The world is looking like ugly. And, it's, you know, all of a sudden, it's like one second, boop, you're with the Lord. And one second, boop, you're coming back to the world again. Well, that was weird. He's just, you're coming back because God's, what, the second coming, right? He's going to pour wrath on again. He's just like, it doesn't make sense at all. Why would you, doop, doop, you know? It, I don't know. Mm. So the last three and a half years, we call the Great Tribulation, right? According to Revelation chapter, well, Jesus pours out, uh, what, the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments. He pours out the bowl judgments on the face of the world. So, uh, I don't know. Wait a minute. Didn't we learn back in 1 Thessalonians, you might ask, in chapter 5, verse 9, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, there's another conflict. If you hold to that view, wait, wait you, uh, <laughs> you're going to have to go through God's wrath, but the Bible says that we're not. So, in Luke 21, 36, Jesus said, watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Uh, we understand those who are worthy according to his blood, those who are covered in righteousness, right, made right according to his blood on the cross, right, his death for us, that positionally we stand in righteousness before him. So we understand a lot of these things, but Jesus also said in uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, that you and I are kind of like the church of Philadelphia, right? That's what he's addressing. That we'll be kept from that hour of tribulation time, that hour of trial. So it's obvious we're not going to go through the tribulation, right? I don't think the last half or after the tribulation period, um, then the rapture will happen. Um, totally against that view. So we will be raptured prior to the 70th week of Daniel. Now there is only one end time view in the Bible. It's not an option, by the way, just to throw that out there. God's not giving us a layout of scripture and saying, okay, go ahead and pick any view you want and it's, you're good. You're good to go on any view. So the, the truth is, only one view is true, and those who hold the other views are really considered as heretics. If they believe it and they teach it, they're, they're giving false doctrine out there. Have you ever thought about that? So right now, I'm either a heretic in teaching you guys this view, or I'm actually telling the truth. 
which is the truth? Uh, I don't know. But that's why I, I would just consider, hey, consider what Scripture says only, and don't consider what other people... Because I actually, I've been listening to a lot of mid-trib view teachings, and why I should believe in their view, and I listen to a lot of post-trib teachings, and why I should believe in their view. And what they, their, those teachings were aimed at people who actually believe, in a pre-trib, meaning the rapture is going to happen before those seven years. And, and it, it, every single thing that I heard was, so-and-so says, the early church fathers, they believe this, and they believe, and this person believes, and that person believes. But I didn't really hear, this is what the Bible says, mm. right? And I look at the Bible, and I look at, you know, those who believe in a pre-trib, based on what, what, is, what is their argument, in a sense? How do they... Uh, present the Word of God. That's what all they do. All they do is say, okay, from Genesis, starting and going through the prophets and the law, and going through the New Testament, and this is the Gospels, and here's the, the letters of Paul, and here's what John says at the end, and here's in Revelation, and everything, eschatology, everything in the, the timeline view fits. And now you can look at Scripture, and it's just it's clear, it's perfect, it's, it's easy, and it's not so like hard to try to cram and try to fit your idea of how it should be it just makes sense right revelation you read it it starts off talking uh addressing the churches right the seven churches of asia then all of a sudden there's it's all talking about tribulation time right you got chapter what is it five six chapter six like chapter 19 and then all of a sudden there it jumps like the millennium and then boom we're with the lord so the the, the church isn't even mentioned during the tribulation time so what's happening there, right? The, according to the book of Revelation, Revelation itself is a pre-trib view. According to a lot of analogies and pictures of, you know, the Old Testament stories, it's all a lot of pre-trib view stuff there. So um, just to throw that out there, it's either one is correct or the other, right? There's, the Bible gives us not the spirit of confusion, Right, but we have the spirit of we we have sound doctrine, right? His word is sound. His word is clear. His word is it's it's perfect, right? So um, just throwing it out out there. So uh, other people, you might say, what about the other people? Are they are they wrong? Um, I don't know. They have the right to be wrong. Uh, just saying. Just kidding. So I'll, I'll say this though: the preacher view. Uh, you're, you're not going to struggle with it, right? You're not going to be wrestling with it. You're not going to be, you know what I mean? It's just, it, it, you're going to look at scripture and everything just seems to fit into place when you see it that way, according to what the scripture says. But then again, just like every other person would say as well, don't listen to the person teaching you. Consider it, take note of it, put it in your heart, but you need to do your research. You need to look up, look up every scripture dealing with this time line and consider what the scripture says in context and you're not really going to have a hard time you're going to be like well that's easy it's right there it's <laughs> that's my mindset um but let's look at verse two again so verse two not to be soon shaken paul says in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us as though the day of christ had come so speaking of the rapture of the church starting the day of the lord uh, the, this period of time, I guess you can say, the day of the Lord, right? Um, it sounds like somebody spoke to the church uh, like a new revelation or a utterance that, from the Lord, right? Thus saith the Lord, God spoke to me and he said... It sounds like something like that may have happened here. I'm not too sure, but you're, you're all in the day of the Lord at this point, and we're all going to fry, and we're, right? It's time to be very, very scared, and, right, run for cover. But Paul says, don't be soon shaken. Hey, don't be all, oh, no, right? So-and-so said they revealed, you know, God spoke to them, so, oh. Guys, don't, don't put your life in other people's words. You know what I mean? Put your life in God's words. And yeah. there's yeah. going to be assurance. There's going to be peace. There's going to be comfort, right? And you're going to be living right. So uh, it, it's, 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 it's all about scripture. So even by, if Paul says, even by letter, right? If somebody forges Paul's handwriting or his signature, just like people hack your accounts today, you know, all of a sudden your Facebook, there's something posted out to everybody, and you're like, hey, that wasn't me. Mm -hmm. 
People usually know who you are, right? They're like, I know you wouldn't send me that. Don't worry. Same thing with Paul. Paul's like, come on, guys. You guys, I've said this stuff to you guys already. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? They know his heart. So it's something that's out there. It's off. Like, you're in the day of the Lord right now. You know? Paul's like, guys, come on. We've we already been there already. Don't believe it. Who's shaking? Go look at them and, you know, like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> this is not happening. So Paul's encouraging them not to be soon shaken. It's not the day of the Lord. You and I don't have to be sh soon shaken either, right? Because we are, we're out of here. <laughs> saying, right? You read all this stuff that's going to be happening on the face of the world, and it should break our hearts for the lost. It should motivate us to give the gospel to the lost, right? It should, it should make us pray more for the lost and our, our enemies, but we're out of here. It should bring some kind of like, woo, I'm, you know, we're going to be caught up and, and out of here. So let's look at the second thing. There's really two things we're going to look at today. The first is really, you know, this, this whole idea of the rapture of the church. And the second thing is the revealing of the Antichrist. Look at verse 3. <clears throat> this, there's an event that needs to proceed, though, before he can actually be revealed. And verse 3 really tells us who, what it is. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day, the day, speaking of the day of the Lord, will not come unless, number one, the falling away comes first. The man of sin that was revealed, the son of perdition. Notice, the falling away comes first before he can be revealed. Notice that the Antichrist, right, he's not... He's not referred to as the Antichrist right here. Who is he referred to as? Man of sin. Man of sin, the son of perdition. So in verse 3, yeah, he's the man of sin, the son of perdition. But look at verse 8. Paul refers to him as the lawless one. Mm -hmm. Interesting. The name Antichrist comes from really 1 John chapter 2, uh, verse 18. It says, Little children, is the last hour. And as you have heard, that the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. So there's those uh, in the spirit of, you can say, uh, the Antichrist. But there is going to be one Antichrist. Now, there's a whole bunch of names given for him. So throughout this study, I'm just going to give one name so that I don't lose your mindset, right? And you're like, wait, who are you talking about? Wait, what's going on? <laughs> so I'm going to refer to him as the Antichrist. Obviously, right here in verse 3, he's the son of perdition. He's the lawless one, according to verse 8. He's the, uh, the, the son of, basically, it's sin, right? But anti, meaning, obviously, uh, opposed to Christ. Everything that's about Christ, he's against, right? Kind of like some people in our government, right? You just look at the Bible, and you look at them, and they're like, no! And they're against it. They're like, oh, spirit of the Antichrist. But he's also referred to in Revelation chapter 11, verse 7, as the beast that comes out from the bottomless pits. Imagine having a title like that. Yeah. <laughs> in Daniel chapter 7, verse 8, he's referred to as the, that little horn. You guys remember that Daniel talks about that comes out of the, the, the ten horns, right? There's mm -hmm. that little horn that rows up. <clears throat> so you might ask, well, okay, all right, I know, I know that the... the He's got a name to him, but when is he going to be revealed? There's an event that needs to take place prior to, before he can actually be revealed to us here in this, in this world, uh, that the Bible says is the falling away needs to happen first before he can reveal himself as, he's not going to say, Hi, ladies and gentlemen, I'm the Antichrist that the Bible talks about that you shouldn't take my mark. <laughs> it's not going to do that, right? Um, but the falling yeah. away, it's the the apostasy, right? We would say, meaning to depart. A, a, a departure is really what the meaning is talking about here. So there's two views as to what the this falling away is referring to. You're looking at it, falling away. Like, what? what is that, right? So the first view <clears throat> is that it refers to uh, a departure, a, a falling away from the faith in Christ, right? It speaks of those who will depart from their faiths, <clears throat> I'm sorry, their faith in the Lord in the last times. Turn with me in your Bibles to uh, the right to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, a question for you guys. Will people depart from their faith in the last times? Mm -hmm. I think so. I think it's true. 1 Timothy chapter 4, look at verse 1. 
It says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience, conscience, conscience seared with a hot iron. Amazing. There it is. Uh, turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Go to your right a little more. 2 Timothy chapter 3. This is speaking about the last days right here. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Look at verse 1. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. There it is. Unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its powers. So these are going to be like pastor, teachers, and churches, right? And from such people turn away, and it goes on, obviously you can read on about it, how... People are going to be in the last days, right? This speaking of the falling away from their faith. Look at chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Look at verse 3. 2 Timothy 4, 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Can you guys see that turning away from the faith? Do you understand? Why are they turning away from their faith according to scripture? Is because they want their own Christianity that fits their own pleasures, their own desires, and they're doing the shopping cart grocery store faith, right? This is my Christianity, and this is the kind of pastor I want. I want him to... Let everybody sin and feel welcomed in the church and, and, and do their own thing. In the, and the, if people feel offended about praying in the church, then that pastor should stop praying. And if he says, let's pray, then we should all do our stretches because that's a type of prayer. And so that's going to be probably the, how people are going to pray, actually, right? Right now we think it's a joke, but that's probably what they're going to be doing about another year, maybe. Right? They're going to let's pray. All right, so let's go ahead and get into study. <laughs> let's, hey, they pick and choose what they want. So they, there definitely will be a turning away. People are going to fall from their faith in these last days that we live in. Clearly, you could do a little checklist, right, from picture 50 years from uh, before right now and look at this checklist. Was people like this 50 years ago, 100 years ago, right? What, what's been the increase, the difference, right? Obviously... It's been increasing and increasing in wickedness and in unrighteousness, unholiness, right? And you look at this list and you look at now, it seems like every single one is a checklist that's been checked off now, right? The day that we're living in really points to these end times the Bible is talking about. So there is a falling away from the faith. Yes. Do I agree with this view? Yes, I do. Do I agree with the first view? Yes, I do. Um, the, the second view is the word falling, falling away means departure. So falling away not only from the faith, but falling away meaning there, a, a departure is going to happen. So when will there be an obvious departure? The rapture. The rapture, what we call the rapture, right? So of the church. So when, when we are raptured, I believe the Antichrist then will be revealed after the fact of the rapture of the church. And I believe you and I are going to be used right now to be we're the restraining force if you will mm -hmm. right so we're being used by the holy spirit in and through our lives to really restrain the antichrist from revealing himself to this world and making himself known uh so notice in verse six go back to second thessalonians 2 uh speaking of the antichrist look at verse six it says now and we're going to skip around right really quick from uh, verses 1 to 7, or really from verse 3 to, to 7. But look at, look at verse 6, let's skip over. And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. But notice, and now you know what, that word what could be referring to the church. Notice the word what, it could be referred to a place, it could be referred to as a thing. I believe it's speaking about the church. Look at verse 7, it says, 
For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he, speaking of the Holy Spirit, is taken out of the way. So this is obvious in our day today. Laws are being passed, right, that are silly. You're like, wait, you know, like certain people that have certain colors, they can say, no, you know, I know I'm white, but I'm really black. Uh, I know I'm a male, but really I'm a female. I know I'm a, right? You're like, uh, yeah. <laughs> and people in our government are like, yeah, I, yeah, yep, yeah, uh-huh. And you're like, uh, morally doesn't make sense at all. I, I don't understand. Uh, but that's, that's the day we're living in right now. So, very interesting. So notice it changed from what in verse 6 now to he in verse 7. And that's the singular. That's speaking of, a, it's a personal pronoun, right? And, and notice in verse 8, just go on to verse 8. And then the lawless one will, will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So the event uh, that will, happens before the Antichrist will reveal himself is a falling away. It's a departure uh, from this world in a sense, right? And it speaks of that great apostasy, the great falling away, if you will, from the faith. So it involves the rapture of the church. Do you guys understand how kind of the, the different views about the tribulation and when the, the rapture will occur? If you place it any other place you want it to go without any backup of scripture, there's going to be a lot of problems. And according to when you're reading this passage alone, now if you just keep it to where it belongs, so you look at verse 1, talking about the rapture, you're talking about the falling away of the faith, it makes sense, there's the rapture, and then, then now the Antichrist could be revealed. And now you're like, oh, well, now everything just it just seems so simple, right? Now you can read every verse without going back a whole bunch, and this way, and going that way. Now you can just verse by verse, like you've been, right, throughout the whole Bible. So it's pretty cool. Um, you and I are being used, right, as that restraining force in this world, uh, because the Holy Spirit is dwelling within our hearts. We are, well, really, it's the Holy Spirit who is restraining the Antichrist from revealing himself, but where does he dwell? In our hearts. So we, as the church, the body of Christ, are that restraining force as well. We're inner, we can't separate, you know what I'm saying? We're, we're together because he dwells in us. So, but what about verse 7 when it talks about he? So what is this he in verse 7? I think that is referring to the Holy Spirit in verse 7. So, and, and the church in verse 6, right? So the church is not a building, by the way. We are, right, the flesh and bone. We, we, the believers who believe in Christ, who have repented of our sins and confessed our sins to the Lord, we believe in who he says he is. We believe in the cross, the literal, uh, physical death and resurrection of Christ, right? We are the believers. We're the church. So the Holy Spirit is indwelling within us. Romans chapter uh, 8, verse 11 Acts uh, 5.32, 1 Corinthians 3.16. In fact, I think I got it. Yep. Um, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? There's a whole bunch of scripture that talks about the Holy Spirit and you as the church, that it's, it's always tied in together. He dwells within us. So, uh, and so he's, he's the restraining force working in and through us. So according to verse 7, when it says he is removed, speaking of the Holy Spirit, the church, right? When he leaves, he's not leaving you behind, right? So don't think, oh, the Holy Spirit left, because people actually believe that, because it needs to fit their agenda, their view, right? So if they believe in this view over here, then they're like, oh, we know the Holy Spirit's leaving at this point, so nobody could be saved during the tribulation time. And you're like, whoa, what? <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh, I understand the Holy Spirit's going to leave, but people are still going to be getting saved. It's going to be pretty hard to get saved. But uh, Hebrews 13.5 says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, and here it is, here's the promise, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So when the Holy Spirit is removed, the Son of uh, a, a perdition, the man of lawlessness, the little horn, the, uh, the beast, the antichrist, who then he will be revealed, right? And that begins the 70th week of Daniel, according to Daniel 9, uh, yeah, Daniel 9.27. So the, the second thing about the antichrist is really the exaltation. 
of really that goes alongside with his revealing. So when he reveals himself, he's going to try to exalt himself, right? And he's going to make himself known to the entire world. Everybody, this is going to be broadcasted, right? Um, however way it's going to be broadcasted. So, uh, but notice in verse 4, 2 Thessalonians, go back a little, who opposes, remember we're still talking about the son of perdition, right, the Antichrist, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. So anything that is, uh, that it's about the word of God, right, anything that uh, the names, the name of God, this Antichrist is going to come in and he's going to say, no, me, whatever his name is, is above who God is. That's what he's trying to say here. Or that is worship. So this is speaking of anything spiritually. All things that are spiritual, right? He's putting himself above everything spiritual. And so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Craziness here. So he opposes, first of all, look at that. That's why we call him anti-Christ, right? He's opposing everything that's Christ. He's against him, worshiping. Uh, speaking of those spiritual things, right? Uh, but so the rapture of the church happens at any given moment of time. Now, I don't know about uh, of any prophecies that need to happen prior to the rapture, so I understand the rapture can happen right now. Amen. Oh, man. Right? Oh, <laughs> Woohoo! Take that video. Uh, but <laughs> there, there, there is one thing that does need to happen. And according to the book of Romans, uh, chapter 11, verse 25, it's talking about the fullness of the Gentiles, yes. right? So apparently there's some kind of something that happens there. I'm not too sure what it is, but it seems like there is a, I don't know, uh, there's a certain, so there's an amount of Gentiles who are going to give their lives to Christ, but there's a limit to the last person who actually is going to give their lives to the Lord. And after that, they're like, no, I don't want Christ. No, I don't want they're not going to choose Christ. So there's an, a, a certain person who is a Gentile, right, who's going to give their life to the Lord, and then, boom, phew, we're out of here. Now, obviously, we don't know that, right? We don't have a meter of, you know, who's saved, who's not saved. That would be nice. Be like, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. <laughs> that would be amazing. But the Antichrist, he's going to come on the scene after that the fact of the rapture then the time clock's going to happen right according to daniel 9 27 all of a sudden it'll begin clicking that seven year period of time and we know when he reveals himself there's some kind of treaty happening right people are going to be saying peace and safety but the, he's gonna uh we'll go we'll get to that treaty part but at that signing of that covenant that revealing of that exaltation of who he is that makes himself above who god is and anything worshipped, he wants to be worshipped above everything, right? That's the moment you know, start it up, right? Let's get out of here. The Antichrist is going to come on the scene. He's going to seem to have all the answers. He's going to be, uh, he's going to be, all the world's going to look to him as a leader. He's going to be some kind of political figure, if you will, in order to get that achievement, right? So maybe he's alive in the world today. I'm not sure. Maybe he's in the world, in this room today. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just joking. He's, I don't know. I don't know if this is the day that we're in right now. I'm pretty sure it is. But no doubt, he's definitely in the political realm. He's definitely probably in the government realm. Um, we know in Ezekiel that uh, there's going to be this League of Nations, really, that's going to come about. In Revelation 17, it talks about a ten nation um, that, that are they're going to come together. And this Antichrist, if you will, is going to bring them together. And, and, and he'll bring some kind of peace treaty, right? According to Daniel 9.27, he's going to confirm a covenant with many, the many, it says. And apparently there's already a peace treaty. So really he's coming in and he's establishing it or he's uh, ratifying it. He's, he's, uh, he's just making, he's, he's making the implements, he's, he's bringing it into totality, right? He's making it happen what's already been there. It's our, so there's, every time there's a treaty, so right now, if you guys look in the news in the last couple months, right, or this last year, there's been a few treaties that have been thrown out there, right? And, and I believe this treaty, it, it involves, really, if you get a treaty that gets the Jews and the Gentiles together and you unite them and bring peace, peace, right, the worldly peace, with them, then that just solved all the world problem, really. Because you look at the, the big 
what's the biggest thing happening in the entire world right now is dealing, it's a spiritual matter, right? That's where all the word, 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 or wars are coming wars. from. I was thinking, world of wars, why? <laughs> yeah, world of wars. Um, but, so anyways, um, he somehow implements all of this, and I, I personally believe that it is going to be dealing with the Muslims and the Jews, so somehow bringing them together, and I think uh, it seems, this peace, it seems like an obvious one, right? If you really think about it, that it's going to be, because the Jews are going to be able to worship their own worship, right? And the Muslims are going to be able to worship on their own, so obviously it seems like there's going to be some kind of establishment of a temple, and that's where that thought comes in. There, if the, the Jews got a temple in Israel, then everybody's happy. The Jews are happy. They're settled in. They got their own nation, right? Everything in Scripture just coming to play, and, except they didn't believe in the Messiah from back then. They're still looking forward. But you got, let's say, let's say the, the t Temple Mount right now, let's say there's another temple, and there's the Jewish temple. And everybody could come together, and it's a, you know, it's not about borders anymore, and you know, there, there's some interesting things that could happen, but the Jews today, they believe that this, the Messiah, when he comes on the scene, he's going to bring peace, but what the Messiah is going to do is he's going to build the temple. And that's why we have, uh, well, in Ezekiel chapter 40, 41, 42, it talks about a temple being built during this time. Revelation 11, you guys remember John the Apostle, he went out and measured this temple that is going to be, right? So very interesting. So the Temple Institute, they say that they already have everything ready to go. It's They got the corner, uh, the, the, the cornerstone. cornerstone, they got all the like implements, they got the, yeah, they got it all going on. They, they say they're ready to go. Uh, they're just waiting for their Messiah, right? And they believe, uh, which is this, I don't know where this came from, but they believe based on some, I don't know where they get it from actually, uh, but their Messiah is coming like this year or next year. The Muslims believe that their Messiah is coming like this year or next exactly. year. And, and they're like all going, that's why all like terrorism is rising up all of a sudden. Because that's what's pumping them up right now is their Messiah is coming. And, and obviously they're both, they're both going to think at this time that that Antichrist leader is their Messiah. And they're both going to be like, oh. <laughs> and it's but those who know the Bible, they're not gonna fall for it. They're gonna no, no, I don't think so. This is what the Bible says, and this is what you are. Uh, uh, right. So, uh, anyways, in the middle of the seven-year period, Jesus talks about an event uh, that that Daniel spoke of, right? And it's called the abomination of desolations. Jesus said in Math or Matthew twenty-four fifteen. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, uh, in other words, whoever reads this, let him understand. But anyways, so once he goes public, making himself out to be God, go as fast as you can, right? You guys can read the context there in Matthew uh, 24, but leave, go as fast as you can and get out of there. Why? Because the Lord is going to start bringing down some heat, right? It's going to... It's going to happen at that moment. God's not going to be like, oh, you're making yourself out to be God. Oh, ain't that nice. I'll come back in a couple more years. No, he's going to be like, I don't think so. <laughs> right? He doesn't like to see people being deceived. He doesn't like to see, you know, false worship happening when he is God Almighty. He's the only one that receives worship. So uh, one aspect of the abomination of desolation is spoken here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. Uh, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sit, sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So once he goes into the temple, he makes himself out to be God, he'll, he'll make a mark that symbolizes himself, basically, right? We call it the mark of the beast, uh, according to Revelation chapter 13 and chapter 14. But this mark will go on your right hand, it'll go on your forehead, and it's the number... Six, 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 right? Whoa. But you, you, you and I are not going to be here. So we have nothing to worry about, right? We don't have to worry about this mark like, oh, no, don't take it. But those who receive this mark, just to throw that out there, um, they, they're, they're giving worship onto the beast when they receive this mark. So they're saying, by taking this mark, I give my allegiance to you. Mm -hmm. And the moment you take this mark, your salvation 
is done. There is no second chance at that moment. It does not fear. It's fair. You've been warned ahead of time, and you yes. still rebelled and went and did it, Amen. thinking you, you know you can make your own God up somehow. But God has made you up, and you need to listen to Him. Uh, but so this mark is going to happen, and and it, 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 we can get into that later. But if you choose not to receive the mark, um, something's going to happen to you, according to the Bible. You're going to die. Okay. It's, uh, the Bible says he will be beheaded. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So, Obviously, there's been an advancement of technology because how are they going to track down all these people, mm. right? How are they going to find them? Now we have all these little cameras in the air, you know, like it's you can't really heat sensors, you mm -hmm. know, and all this stuff. They, they can see like every they can see through your walls. It's crazy. They can shoot through the wall and get it's crazy technology that we have. So anyways, let's just finish the rest later. We'll get to it part two next week or uh, whenever we get to it in our next study. Um, Jesus, thank you so much, Lord, that you have called us into your presence that is uh, full of peace, full of assurance, full of, uh, Lord, just abiding you and living for you and just about you. There's so much benefits, Lord, that you give us just by being with you, Lord, that are so good. And uh, I just thank you, Father, for calling us into your presence. And I pray, uh, Lord, that we would be learned in this area of end-time events, Lord, that your word talks about. Help us to be aware of our surroundings. Help us to be aware of the headlines and the things that are happening right now. And just realize, Father, that you're coming back very soon, Father. Amen. So help us not to be caught up in ourselves or in the world. Um, help us, Lord, to be caught up in you and literally caught up in the clouds with you. And so uh, we pray, God, that we would uh, just flourish right now, Lord, in our faith for you and that you, by your Holy Spirit, would through, do a work in and through our lives, Lord. And so uh, we love you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.